Well, welcome back, everyone. Um, I'm Ross Virginia. It's my honor and pleasure to be co-lead scholar with Mike Sfrega. Um, Mike, thank you for the introduction earlier. And um, you've had an opportunity to hear from the first group working on um, resilient but now thriving communities. And um, although we have these two groups, these groups are very closely connected. These topics don't divide evenly and nicely. And um, what we found, though, is that in order to have a resilient, thriving community, you need a sustainable economy. That's really at the basis of the future of the development and, and the c creating the kinds of lives that people of the North want to have. So um, we have a group focused on sustainable economies. They're up here right now. Um, you can see that from where they're from, they have a very diverse set of uh, locations, but also disciplines. So um, they're going to present on their core work. Um, they're going to have a discussion amongst themselves for a little bit, um, as I understand the, their approach to all of this. And then we'll have time for Q&A, OK? And that'll be followed by panel three, um, where we kind of bring some of this together and talk a little bit about the future of the program. OK, so that's where we're going. So I'm going to turn it over to our good friends on the Sustainable Economies panel. Welcome. Thank you. Thank you, Ross. Uh, thank you, Mike, and the Wilson Center for hosting us. Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for coming. Um, it's an absolute privilege to be here um, and to have the opportunity to share uh, some of the topics we've been discussing for the last year and a half. Um, my name is Ellie Bors. Uh, I'm a marine biologist and currently a postdoctoral scholar at Oregon State University on the West Coast. Uh, my Fulbright research focused on climate change and fisheries um, in the Arctic and subarctic. Um, and I'm going to uh, introduce my colleagues and then sort of briefly discuss some of the overarching questions and topics and then uh, hand it on over down the line. Um, so to my left, we have Laura uh, Johans Dotir, uh, who is a professor and the director of the Graduate Program in Environmental and Natural Resources at the School of Business at the University of Iceland. Uh, you'll hear her speak about her Fulbright research at Dartmouth College, focused on marine-related oil spills um, in the Arctic. Um, then we have uh, Svetlana Tuleva, uh, who is an assistant professor of, uh, at the Russian Presidential Academy of National Economy and Public Administration. Uh, she's interested in legal sociology and environmental sociology. She did her exchange at Bowdoin College um, and studied adaptive governance in Arctic regions. And you'll also hear a little bit about how that ties into our major theme of risk and sustainable economies. Um, to her left and your right, we have Todd Sformo, who is a biologist living in Utkiagavik, Barrow, Alaska. Um, he works for the North Slope Borough Department of Wildlife Management, and you will hear some about his uh, individual research as well on freshwater mold infecting a subsistence fish. Um, to your right still further is Elena Gladun. She is a doctor of law um, and professor at the University of Tumen uh, in Russia. Her research interests um, include northern indigenous peoples and legal reg regulations of natural resources in the Arctic. Um, she did her exchange at the University of Alaska in Anchorage. Um, and all the way to the other end of the table uh, is my colleague Soily Nustin Harla. Uh, she is a professor of commercial law and the dean of the faculty at the law of law at the University of Lapland. Um, she's interested in governance of private corporations as well as rights of indigenous peoples in the Arctic. And she did her exchange at the University of Washington um, in Seattle. So uh, as Ross mentioned and Mike mentioned earlier, and you can tell from those introductions, we are a pretty interdisciplinary group uh, with a broad range of interests. We came together to address what I think are really fundamental um, and also very complex questions about the Arctic. What is a sustainable economy? What is an Arctic economy? Is there something about Arctic economies that's unique? Um, if so, what are those things? What are those traits? And how do we think about them? Um, as an interdisciplinary group, we had to work pretty hard to identify the differences. Well, I guess we maybe didn't hurt, work that hard to identify the differences in our vocabularies. But we had to work to understand what those differences in our vocabularies meant and how to find a shared language to blend uh, that, those disciplinary backgrounds. We ended up settling on, on really focusing on this topic of risk, uh, risk assessment, risk management, risk communication in the Arctic. I think everyone as an individual can in some ways resonate with the word risk or the concepts of risk assessment and management in decisions we make uh, daily. But also, of course, it plays a central role in business. It plays a central role in policy. Um, and I think that um, hopefully we'll talk about how to bring in some community level um, issues and individual issues um, in northern communities. Um, 
this topic captures some of the tensions between um, interests that uh, occur in the Arctic. Um, it captures the complexity of decision making in the region um, and I think exposes some gaps in management structures and processes that, that we will talk about and hopefully we'll continue to, to talk about in, in years to come. Um, and I wanted to share, um, oh, that's us. I wanted to, to share an image here um, from uh, a, just a picture that I took when I was in Henningsvær in the Lofoten Islands in Norway. That's where I, I was privileged to do my exchange for um, the Fulbright program. This is a, a public artist um, who, uh, Pöbel, who has painted um, this mural on an oil gas tank. Um, and it's a, you may not recognize it, but it's a pretty iconic figure of a fisherman. The face and the beard is, is in Norway, sort of um, this, this symbolic figure of a fisherman. And he's wearing um, oil and gas rig gear. So he has on his coveralls, he's got oil slicked across his body, um, has the ear protection. Um, and this is intended to symbolize that in that region there's ongoing discussion about um, whether or not the waters around the Lofoten Islands should be open to oil and gas um, exploration and exploitation. And the Lofoten Islands have been um, a massive cod uh, spawning ground and fishing ground for a very long time. Vikings lived in the Lofoten Islands and lived off of the cod there. So this is really trying to encapsulate that huge identity relationship between the people who live there, the activities that they do, and the threats and the risks that they might face from further economic development. Um, so with that, I'm going to actually uh, hand over now to Laura. Um, she is going to present to you a framework um, that we developed uh, for Arctic economies. Yes. Thank you, Ali. Um, yes, so you have actually this framework in, in the policy brief. Uh, the handout, but uh, this is a, a framework that uh, our group uh, developed together. But as you have heard in this uh, afternoon that the Arctic currently holds a prominent place in global policy. Uh, this is a sparsely populated region that is experience, experiencing major substantial, uh, substantial and rapid changes and uh, that creates both opportunities but also risk for economic development. Informed policy making for sustainable well development in the Arctic will require an understanding of the specific structures of Arctic economies. And given these conditions, our group developed this framework. But uh, as you see in the middle of the framework, it demonstrates that Arctic economies are often complex systems on a sliding scale between subsistence, which are non-monetized, economies and the market, ec market eco economies with the various versions of mixed economies in between the subsistence and market economies. Uh, subsistence activities prominent in uh, indigenous communities, uh, these are activities such as hunting, herding, fishing and gathering, uh, resonates with uh, community culture and identity. of this uh, uh, conference. Uh, market activities, expected, they are expected to expand in the Arctic. It, 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 they include shipping, oil and gas extractions, mining, tourism, and commercial fishing. And func function of Arctic economies, therefore, are also across local and global spatial scale, as you can see in this model. Um, the framework furthermore highlights the Arctic specific institutional context uh, as well as their critically important social, cultural and environmental context. Uh, more complete discussion about this framework is to be found in a paper uh, that the group has published recently in a journal called Global Policy. Based on this framework, we will now present the uh, examples demonstrating uh, risk cases that we can uh, or are, are grounded in this particular framework. So we are discussing cases uh, on a different scale from global to local. The first case um, that we are, uh, we are presenting is this one. And this is uh, a resource that I conducted, uh, and it's about marine-related oil spills. Um, and uh, then uh, we will also have a case about indigenous uh, 
indigenous economies and also a case about particular uh, subsistence fish. But starting with this oil scale case, so what I did was I looked at the 10 of the biggest oil spills, marine related oil spills in the world to figure out uh, or, or just to, to get this, uh, uh, to see like the holistic uh, picture of these, uh, of the consequences or potential consequences. Um, for this paper, um, it started by developing a scaling of risks and placing the, this scale in the Arctic context. So on the top level of this pyramid, you will see the subsistence level of risks. This means, for instance, a risk to individuals or families in the Arctic. The next level is an enterprise level of risk. And since this was a case that was focusing on oil spills, uh, enterprise level of risk is, uh, for instance, the ships or oil rigs. Uh, because all the cases that I looked in, into were either uh, related to transportation of oil or uh, drilling. Uh, then the next uh, level is portfolio level of risks, and these are the industries. And in this case, this would be the shipping industry or the oil and gas industry. Uh, this is then followed by a systemic level of risks when break breakdown of systems start to incur. And this was the level of analysis uh, that uh, was uh, used for the for this particular uh, research and the uh, fifth level in this pyramid is existential level of risk such as risk to the pristine arctic environment or climate change you will also see arrows in this particular uh, model that shows that there is a loop between the existential level of risk and the subsistence level of risk and i will explain this also um, later, but uh, uh, so when we are thinking about these different levels or, or discussing systemic level of risk, how, how would we define them? Uh, according to a scholar called Swartz, uh, he says that uh, in case of systemic risk, there is a trigger event, uh, a tipping point, which can be an institutional failure or economic shock that causes a chain of bad uh, economic consequences, sometimes referred to as a domino effect. Uh, one should also keep in mind that systemic risk is seen as a risk to a system, rather than a risk within a system. Uh, additionally, systemic risk is often or most often discussed, and that was something that came out of this uh, study. This is mostly discussed in the context of financial institutions or markets, rather than focusing on a risk to other systems, such as social systems. Um, and uh, so when you once move to uh, analyzing risk on a systemic level, you will see more of a holistic uh, picture of potential consequences. And that is shown in, the, in this uh, particular slides. So the potential consequences of oil spills will not just have economic impacts, or environmental impact, but uh, there are other consequences as well. So this uh, particular analy analysis showed that there are also a social and cultural impacts, but also uh, implications for security and policy uh, making. And there will also be impacts or consequences for businesses and partners that are involved in this particular spill. Um, so going back to the previous slide about this uh, risk scale model, as well as the conceptual model that I started with, this case highlights that what may be an opportunity for the market economy might be a risk for the subsistence e uh, economy, even to the extent that this might cause existential level of risk uh, if worst case scenario happens. Uh, thank you, Adam. So uh, I will speak um, about another case, which we investigated uh, during our collective um, project. It was focused on um, on uh, indigenous economies and its development and um, uh, market relations. Um, and we analyzed some social consequences and social risks uh, related to these processes. 
So we identified several three main types of um, indigenous economies which exist now. Uh, the first type is um, subsistence economy is, tradi is based on traditionally uh, on traditional using of natural resources and uh, it's based on uh, reindeer husbandry, fishing, hunting. And the second type is a state supported economy. It means that the state uh, allocates uh, some social payments and uh, social supports uh, for uh, for indigenous communities to support indigenous uh, style of life, traditional style of life. And the third type is market economy, uh, and uh, it's, it means market relations. And one of the main concerns uh, is uh, that transition from, uh, but in, in general, in, in real life, uh, in most of cases, we uh, we meet uh, a mixed economy, of course, uh, with, which uh, consists of uh, subsistence, uh, uh, market relations, and um, some uh, social transfers. Uh, but um, one of the main concerns is uh, that transition from subsistence to market economy uh, can lead to the transformation or deformation of uh, indigenous identity or indigenous culture. Uh, for example, um, uh, if you speak about uh, development of market uh, relations, it means that uh, sometimes it can, uh, it can be resulted uh, in deformation of uh, or in transformation of some uh, traditional norms uh, related uh, to their attitude to nature, uh, to their careful uh, using of natural resources. Uh, for example, um, ability to sell, um, for example, fish in big in large quantities uh, can uh, can lead to the situation when. Uh, nature um, begins to be considered as uh, mostly as uh, sources of uh, material well-being, and uh, people can lo can lose uh, their sacred attitude to nature. Uh, or another example can be uh, can be related uh, can be connected with the uh, commercialization of indigenous culture. It's a situation when indigenous communities. Uh, rep um, reproduce uh, some elements of their um, indigenous culture in accordance with um, expectations of external actors. Uh, for example, companies and corp um, some corporations and state authorities allocate some funds among indigenous communities and they, have, they impose their stereotypes about indigenous culture. And uh, local people, indigenous communities try to meet this exp their expectations just to get some funding. So uh, we can say that uh, um, all these situations uh, produce um, some social risks for indigenous communities. Oh, I get a form. I do <laughs> give a form thought. <coughs> okay, I get the the ugly photo here to show you. <laughs> um, <coughs> <laughs> uh, we started here. Uh, so my individual project was really community informed, and the community is Nuiqsut, Alaska. Uh, it's one of the eight North Slope Borough uh, villages. My ex it was an actual experiment, and this was examined, uh, examining the growth rate of a freshwater mold called Saprolignia parasitica, uh, and it co colonizes some specific uh, subsistence fish, such as this one, anaclic or broad whitefish. My six-week Fulbright exchange took place at the University of Victoria in British Columbia. So the rest of the time really gave, or outside of the time, really gave me the chance to, or the opportunity to try to situate the mold in a larger context, just um, not just science, but so, sort of science and society, along with, you know, the uh, uh, individuals in this group. As Laura, Laura mentioned, uh, one common factor in various analyses of systemic risk is um, the recognition of the triggering event. So what I tried to do was to... Um, Think about the mold as a triggering event, and these tend to come in kind of two flavors. One is endogenous risk, which is risk to with, within the system, and it sort of spreads outward like that. Uh, and then the other is exogenous risk, so a risk or a shock from outside the system coming into the, uh, the system. And then in this case, the system is uh, subsistence. Turns out, Doing this is a little bit more difficult than I thought, uh, and that may have a lot to do with me, but it, it also has to do with the status of the mold itself. So uh, here is the briefest account I can give you with the mold. 
It was the last week of September in 2013 that the Department of Wildlife Management received a lot of calls and actually some fish uh, from local uh, subsistence fishermen. And they said there were these sick fish that we needed to take a look at. They wanted to know what it was, why is this happening now? And so we're still continuing to work on those kind of questions. His uh, look back further revealed that there was only one single case of a single fish in 1980 that also had this infection, as you see here. Yet, from Western science point of view, this uh, mold is worldwide. So it goes for, it's known to be in the Arctic all the way down to the Antarctic. And that's why they, I have it in uh, the word new in uh, quotes there, because I'm not really sure the status of this mold <coughs> yet. So my current thinking on designating the mold as a triggering event seems to be, or the best way of doing this right now is that it seems to be st um, uh, stakeholder dependent. So going back to the framework, on uh, the specific axes of uh, our axis of uh, subsistence to market economy, if you tend to associate more with the market economy or fully monetized economy, I think there's a case to be made that you would talk about it as an endogenous form of, uh, of risk. Because then um, the mold is Within the environment, we have some evidence for that. It has occurred in the environment, uh, the infection has occurred at one time, at least in, the in, um, in this particular area. But it, by doing that, you also kind of take out the, any responsible party. If you look at it from a subsistence point of view, you start to look at it as an exogenous uh, form where it's imposed upon you. And so an N of 1 for that 1980, you know, example just doesn't seem like it's, it's, it's very prevalent in the area. So it's this difficulty in trying to associate the mold as a triggering event under these two terms that I think was very, very interesting for me to be in, in, in this group. And I had never done this uh, or thought about it in these terms before. So that was my work. Thank you. I don't. Ah, okay. <laughs> uh, but and now we have, based on our joint uh, or individual research and based on our joint research, uh, we have come to some conclusions and recommendations which are here. And uh, to save our time, I'm not going to go very deeply through them, but I would like to underline that uh, above all these recommendations, we have discovered so many challenges uh, in the Arctic uh, environment and the Arctic social uh, environment and Arctic traditions that we feel that we need some more joint more multidisciplinary research, some more uh, deep studies of what is going on in the Arctic. And uh, just to to attract your attention to some of these uh, policy recommendations, which you have um, printed and you can read them and uh, we can discuss them later. I would like to ask some questions uh, which can attract your attention and our attention to some specific uh, Arctic risks. And the first question is about ecological risks. Well, uh, my uh, question is, what does scientific community need to evaluate ecological risks across all uh, entire circumpolar region and uh, to get evidence that these problems are not local, that they are really take place uh, across all Arctic uh, environment and are they, uh, can they be scaled as uh, global risks, not just local risks? Um, uh, it, it, you know, currently, currently, this seems to be a local uh, situation. It is occurring uh, within the Nuiqsut New area. But I do have evidence uh, uh, taking water samples throughout the North Slope that this mold is present in these uh, rivers and streams. And so we started to try to figure out, <clears throat> does this happen in uh, the circumpolar uh, regions? And that's been very difficult to find funding to do it across borders for these kind of issues. We had uh, one um, guest speaker from uh, the uh, from our t uh, monthly teleconferences, and uh, so I've given him photos of the mold. And when he's in Russia, he is you know talking to fishermen to see whether it's present right there. But no one has seen it. Um, except for this uh, Nuiqsut area. Even in the uh, fishermen we talked to in the uh, Nuvialuit area, they haven't seen this. So we really would like to establish some type of baseline understanding of whether the mold is present and could cause an infection at some point. Um, but the funding for that kind of work has been very difficult to get. And do you think that risk assessment should be coordinated across all Arctic states, should be like certain standards, certain way of 
examining these risks? Do that one, Ellie? <laughs> <laughs> well, I actually had a, a comment follow up on, on, you used the word baseline. And I think that um, one thing I wanted to talk about is the existence of these big biodiversity reports that the Arctic Council has done. So there's the Arctic Biodiversity Assessment, um, and there's some circumpolar monitoring programs now that are um, up and running in different, at least in the marine environment, in different sort of parts of the marine environment. And I just wanted to pin the importance of those large assessments um, and also some of the limitations. I think that in general, a lot of those are um, you know, written as a essentially a literature review on the Arctic um, Arctic science, and there are almost always huge sections um, that are missing or that for which there are not published um, data. And I think that what's kind of interesting <laughs> is is to try to put together this um, you know local monitoring, local observations, indigenous knowledge of what has been there and what you know what is changing, um, which has come up, I think, in, in a lot of our discussions, um, and blend those into some of these large circumpolar monitoring and uh, biodiversity assessments. So that's just something to kind of note. Um, I don't know the, the funding side of that. It really just takes, it takes will and it takes a lot of boots on the ground and a lot of discussions, right? Um, so I just wanted to pin that. I think you you would then I guess if you want me to speak to the the across different nations I would just say um, you know one thing we've talked about a lot is how different the Arctic is in the different um, re places right you know it's it's one region but it's extremely different in terms of the context and that's something that came up in the previous group and also is really integral to our framework as well as that context is key the system that you're defining and the system that you're working with um, is critical to um, to I guess define and then work within and that if you're missing pieces of the system either willfully or accidentally um, you know you run into some trouble so I think in that everyone should strive to define the system wholly in which they are working um, that that is a, an approach that can be arctic wide but that the solutions and maybe the policy instruments won't necessarily be the exact same in all our all arctic countries. Okay, well, my next point is about social risks, which you have already discussed. And uh, the question is, can we speak about risk to traditional culture? Is it a risk? And to what scale it can be referred to? Is it a global risk? Is it a national or is that a local risk? Okay. Uh, as for risks for um, indigenous culture, yes, of course, uh, um, further industrial development and uh, market relations um, produce uh, some risks for some social and cultural risks for indigenous culture. Uh, it can be connected with uh, commodification of indigenous culture and uh, with uh, disappearing of uh, indigenous languages. Uh, for example, industrial development um, lead, uh, leads to the reducing of um, indigenous lands and we know that uh, indigenous identity is closely connected with indigenous lands. So of course um, it, it it, bring, it brings um, a lot of risks, and uh, they can be it's system it's systemic risk of risks of course because uh, it may be a threat um, for the whole system for the whole communities, and uh, this brings uh, can uh, these risks uh, can be brought by global actors, uh, such for example global corporations, but they bring these risks at the local level. So uh, I think. Uh, we can we can say that uh, all these global and local risks are closely mm, connected. Uh, so, okay. And uh, maybe my last question is about not about risk but about solutions. And I would like to just ask: Does international awareness, this global awareness that which we all have and we have made our global recommendations, uh, does this uh, awareness of Arctic risks lead, uh, lead to some meaningful changes in national legislation, in national policies, in national agendas? And does this national level uh, and national uh, decision-making process relevant to what we have found on the global level? Yes, okay. Um, recommendations are, of course, always recommendations, and it is up to the governments to, to decide whether they want to want to, to respond to these recommendations or not. This is the existing uh, understanding of state sovereignty. <laughs> uh, but I, I would like to take up this that corporations actually are, um, are um, um, quite eager to implement uh, international standards. And um, maybe this is to show, well, it is to show their awareness of, of uh, of the um, 
environment, the, uh, the social I uh, rights, and so on. Um, this might be, well, some, some people call this greenwashing, but it's not totally greenwashing because uh, uh, market is quite uh, an effective driver. So um, if, you, if you lose your reputation, if a, a company lose, loses its reputation, that's maybe a systemic risk also <laughs> for the company, so that this, this company uh, may even bankrupt or um, it may have serious bis uh, uh, consequences for, for the company. Um, but what comes to, to the governments, um, it is more problematic and um <coughs> I would like to take up one example, which is, well, that the indigenous peoples uh, increasingly take up uh, um, take up these uh, international conventions and international principles to, to support their own own rights, and um, and especially this declaration on on the rights of of the indigenous. Uh, and also the ILO convention are such that are often referred to. Uh, and in Finland we are in the middle of crisis because of this. And, and the, the reason is that uh, the Sami de uh, demand uh, implementing this um, United Nations convention uh, instead of national law. And they say that national law is above this, in, in, this uh, uh, international law is above this this uh, national law and it should be implemented in on the national level as as you said that <laughs> it may this may happen uh, but this is the law national law is what our uh, um, supreme administrative court applies and this is um, this dispute is about who is a sami so uh, <laughs> who is indigenous uh, and we have a uh, legislation on that but it's not quite consistent with this UN Declaration of, of Indigenous Rights. So legal pluralism is called legal pluralism when we have, you know, regulations on the international, national, maybe indigenous law also. Uh, it is, I would say that it is a good thing that it can lead to this, that, that um, you take up di these different approaches. But it can also be quite, quite confusing. It can cause these kind of disputes, which in Finland seems that it's just escalating and escalating and nobody knows how to stop this, this uh, dispute, what to, what to do about it. Okay. Yeah, it's just one point here. <laughs> yeah, well, from Russian perspective, I also can say that sometimes governments, government, national government can be reluctant to some changes, but the more it's raised at the international level, the more the governments react. That's my personal opinion, and I think the experience of programs like ours, for example, it can be very effective because we all go back to our home countries and we will be like uh, promoting all these ideas, we will be introducing all these recommendations and show that the action can be taken and the action can be taken in this or that direction and it really can change our national, local level. So according to risks or concerning risks or concerning some other points which we have discovered in our joint research and our individual research. Mm. Yeah, that's it. <laughs> so I think we now we're hoping to turn to you guys for some questions in the audience. I will say I will have um, Mike uh, moderate that. I just wanted to note that I I was remiss earlier and I intended to acknowledge our two group members who were not able to join us in DC. Uh, so Senna Larsen, who's our uh, Danish uh, scholar uh, from Aalborg University, and Daria Gritsenko, who's um, um, also from Finland um, at, from the University of Helsinki. So I invite Mike up here now to uh, field some questions or take some questions and I guess we'll field them. Okay, I'm guess here, uh, okay, right here to my <laughs> left. That was uh, easy, I'm glad I could help. Ellie? <laughs> Please. Uh, thank you very much, uh, all of you. Um, just a quick question about the nature of the market creating a risk to the indigenous identity of an area. Um, the is it possible for different types of market activity to mitigate or accelerate the risk that they pose to indigenous identity? And let me rephrase that. Let me put that in a second way to make it easier to understand. Assume for a moment that some businesses that are 
forward looking, uh, influenced by shareholders and other pressures, um, to desire to create a different, you know, more green, more circular type of business activity. Could those businesses find ways to mitigate the risks that they might pose to indigenous identity? Or is the risk from market activity to indigenous identity categoric and difficult and impossible to mitigate? Um, thank you for the question. Yes, uh, so of course the market and development of market relations is a normal process uh, yeah, it, um, and we, <laughs> we can't escape it. And um, I think there are a lot of market mechanisms which can help to reduce these risks for indigenous communities. Yeah, for example, if you talk about uh, in um, um, decision making processes, uh, yeah, when uh, corporations can delegate some uh, some opportunities for local communities uh, to divide some funds uh, to to develop their own projects, um, and uh, for example, another mechanism. Another mechanism can be benefit sharing arrangements, which, uh, which is also widespread in, in the world and in different Arctic regions. But sometimes this, um, the problem is that sometimes these mechanisms uh, lead to the unexpected uh, consequences. Yeah, for example, uh, we have a um, bright example at, in Russia at Sakhalin Island, where Sakhalin Energy uh, in implemented a lot of uh, programs uh, for indigenous communities and they delegate um, some uh, rights and opportunities for local communities to, to develop um, their um, uh, programs, their own programs. And it was, it, it, ha it, it had a lot of positive consequences, but on the other hand, it stimulated a lot of conflicts among indigenous communities. So uh, these programs, uh, these market mechanisms should be um, completed with some um, educational programs for local communities and some trainings and so on. But of course, it's possible to, to reduce these risks with market mechanisms. Yeah, thank you. May I continue a bit? <laughs> uh, well, for in, um, in, uh, in the Nordic countries, we have had a lot of uh, disputes um, between the reindeer herders and, and, and then, um, I mean, it's reindeer herders and uh, building wind power and energy there in the north. So they claim that, uh, the Sami claim, or, or the reindeer herders generally claim that uh, uh, it disturbs the, uh, the reindeer, and the, especially their calving, and this is definitely true. Uh, but, uh, of course, we can hope that this industry could somehow develop. They have already developed this wind power, these mills, so that uh, they would be better. But, uh, well, I would say that at the moment, especially in Finland, all these wind power projects that we have in the Sami homeland, they are like frozen at the moment, because there is no dialogue between uh, the Sami reindeer herders and uh, and um, and these these companies but um, mm, yeah in outside the Sami homeland they do build these these windmills oh, oh, go ahead. yeah I will I'm going to make a very short remark, but probably uh, the solution here is to, uh, to somehow to encourage a uh, mutually educational process, but not only for indigenous people, how to behave in these changing conditions, so that everything is changing and market is what we have now in uh, everywhere, locally and nationally, but it's they should be taught how to keep, uh, preserve their culture, but on the other hand, uh, industries uh, should be also taught how to behave on the territories of indigenous people, how to create these mutually beneficial conditions. But uh, in Russia, for example, there is no legal rule which uh, promote or pro promulgate this uh, necessity, necess necessity for the uh, companies to behave like that, to be like that on the territories of indigenous people. And I'm sure that in some other Nord uh, Arctic countries there is no rule like that, so of this educating uh, newcomers, educating industries which have come to the indigenous lands. Mm -hmm. And I was just going to add, I, I don't think it's categorical. I think um, there's maybe a l way of looking at uh, for-profit native corporations as a way of kind of threading, you know, that needle between 
traditional business goals, but also traditional subsistence activities. And maybe one uh, particular example would be the uh, conflict avoidance agreement that is a voluntary agreement between um, uh, the uh, Alaska Eskimo Whaling Commission and uh, 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 large-scale uh, companies so that they kind of cease uh, seismic activity or any type of activity that puts water uh, sound in the water during particular time and space dur uh, for uh, um, uh, uh, whaling. So that's, and it's, yeah, so that, that would be a possible example. And it does seem, and this is, I, I don't really have much of a background, but it does seem that um, the larger companies do have a have a, a little bit more of an advantage in trying to mitigate some of these impacts because it, mitigating does take a, a certain amount of money. So the smaller companies, you know, they, they have a bit of a disadvantage compared to the larger ones. So. Yeah, I would li also like to add to this because uh, we believe that the framework, the co conceptual framework that we have intro introduced is also important and that it is, it is important uh, for policymakers, but also for businesses and for research, because it has the elements that we think are important for people to use. Uh, but also in the paper that we wrote together, we also believe that uh, this framework is not only applicable to the Arctic, but also in all the parts of the world where we have the, this uh, different types of economy coexisting existing such as subsistence market and mixed economies and this could for instance be in the Amazons. So we believe that the framework is of value not just in the Arctic re region but it has a much broader relevance uh, for policymakers, businesses and, and uh, researchers. Okay, well that was one question that brought us almost <laughs> all the way. That's, that's great. Uh, Ellie, do you, do you have any thoughts on that particular issue, just to like t tie it up? I mean, I did, but I actually decided not to share them in the interest of time. Well, <laughs> I, I'm, I'm going to give you some time, so it's up to your interest. Go really? ahead. I think you were joking, but um, no. <laughs> I'm going to do it anyway. Um, I was just going to briefly try to channel our colleagues in the other group and say um, that one thing I, th I think just that popped into my mind, and of course, like, this is not my field, um, is that when people talk about offsets or mitigation, often I think it might be a situation like, hey, we, we did this bad thing that you didn't want, and here's this, here's something nice and shiny in return. <laughs> and so, like, here, hey, sorry about the mine, we paved that road over there. <laughs> but it's really, really important that the, oh, <laughs> that's my Siri on my phone. I don't know how it started talking. You, you could not have planned that. <laughs> but I think, but I think, what I feel like this is a very serious when Siri point makes herself you know, into that, <laughs> um, it would be important to actually speak to the community and say, you know, here are these risks and these challenges that are going to be, you know, happening with this development project. One, hopefully, there'd be some way to say, well, we don't want that, but you know, we want to do something positive. What, what is, what is it? And maybe that road doesn't need to be paved. Probably not. Um, and maybe it's something else. And so I think just that idea of like involving in the discussion and what is it that your mitigation or offset is going to be i i just wanted to channel that a little and try to try to put that in that conversation great i'm glad we we took the time <laughs> so uh i i am glad we took the time uh, thank you all very much for an outstanding panel i want to thank you for the questions would you please recognize this outstanding group of scholars <laughs> mm -hmm.